This exchange of gifts given for nothing but the love of God becomes a mystical dance in which gifts are continually exchanged between God and God's people. Do you remember your first job? Oh, yeah. Yes. I had a cousin who was running for Congress one year, and I think I was about nine years old, and he came and asked me, uh, gave me $20 to pass out bumper stickers. And as far as I can remember, that was the first time that someone had given me money in exchange for me doing something for them. And I remember just being amazed by this secret of the universe that I had discovered. And $20 was a lot of money for a nine years old. It's a lot of money to a 31 year old. And among the many things that I learned that day was the lesson that people would pay me money to do things. Well, I started working more regularly I worked in my grandfather's restaurant, I worked for my grandma at the school, I worked two jobs in high school, three in college, and then I went to seminary, and that was the first time that I was not regularly employed in some type of job. <coughs> I would do odd jobs here and there for a little extra spending money, but I learned pretty quickly that I couldn't focus on the things that I was there to study if I also had another job that I had to do. And it's this focus that lies behind what St. Paul is talking about in the lesson today in 1 Corinthians 9. Throughout the chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, St. Paul is making a defense of his apostolic calling. And in particular, he's defending his rights as an apostle, specifically noting that along with the other apostles, he too has the right to a wife, to food and drink provided by those in his cure, and to not work for a living. To not work for a living. I had to read that again. I thought I misread it. Now that doesn't seem odd. It should seem odd. It's contrary to what most of us think should be the case. It's contrary to what the Corinthians thought. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't be defending it. So what's the deal here? Well, in an article a few years ago, Father Zach Coons took up the question of, should priests be paid to pray? And at the root of his question was a wondering just what a priest or a bishop, apostle, is paid for. And to make a long story short, he argues that the clergy are paid to do nothing, that we are paid not to work. I told Ryan what my sermon was about, and he said, good luck with that. <laughs> now, I know this seems antithetical to much of what we think as Americans, but what lies behind this is the importance of bishops, who are the successors of the apostles and priests and other ministers to be free from the confines of a regular job. And so ministers are given a stipend as opposed to a salary or an hourly, hourly wage. They're given an allowance to live, to pay the mortgage, to take a vacation, to get an oil change. And then this way we don't have to go out and get a job which will inevitably distract us from the vocation we've been given. In essence, we're paid to do nothing so that we are free to be priests. Father Coons's article demands extensive quotation. He says, I feel the significance of this freedom the most when parishioners ask me to pray for them. Lord knows that when most of us ask a friend to pray for us, a big part of us expects them to forget. And so in self-preservation, we don't really expect them to. But I feel a different and unspoken expectation 
when I receive those kinds of requests as a priest, which is something like, of course I hope my friends pray for me, but I suspect most of them are too busy for that. However, the church has set you aside as a priest. The church has freed you to live an intentionally unproductive life so that I do not have to doubt that you will pray for me. If we're not paid to do any of the things we schedule, write, or facilitate, then all that we do is therefore offered as a gift. In other words, the church isn't actually paying us to be there on Sunday to preside at the altar. The church is paying us so that we can sleep in our beds the night before. We're not paid to preach. We're not paid to administer last rites. To think that we are cheapens those beautiful moments by stirring in a transactional flavor. We're paid so that we can pray for free. End quote. And to his point, thinking of ministry in the ways that we think of everything else in the world turns ministry into just another service. The church becomes just another service provider, and the ministers become just another member of the professional class. But to think of it in the terms that Paul is thinking of it means that what I do here on Sunday is a gift I offer to God for your benefit. I don't send the church a bill for my preaching, but I proclaim the gospel free of charge. And you all, for your gift, ensure that I don't starve. The music that Ben plays is a gift that he offers to God for our edification, and we make sure he can afford a place to live. The money that you put in the plate is a gift offered to God for the good of the whole community. And the community gives you the gift of itself. And we know that this is not a mere exchange, a quid pro quo, because all of this is available no matter what you give. We don't have dues here. It's a gift. This is why the offering is brought forward and placed on the table, because it is being offered to God so that, like the bread and the wine, it is blessed and transformed for the good of everyone. If that bread and that wine just stayed in the cabinet and the sacristy, it will eventually decay. If it's used for something else, it just remains bread and wine. If your gifts remain in your possession, then they are used to benefit you, or elf left unused, until moth and rust consume it. But when we bring these things forward each Sunday, we put bread and wine on the table, we drop tokens of our labor into the plate and place it on the altar. I summon all of my ability to offer to God what I am able in word and sacrament. Ben uses all of his skills and talents to offer music you bring all of your experiences and devotion and prayer to this moment, and God takes the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and then turns around and gives it right back to us. Only now, the bread and the wine are the body and blood of his son. This exchange of gifts given for nothing but the love of God, becomes a mystical dance in which gifts are continually exchanged between God and God's people for the blessing of the entire world. You give bread and wine, God gives back the body and blood of his son. You give back gratitude, God gives back blessing. You bless others, others bless God, God blesses them, and so on and so on forever and ever. We are caught up in this web of thanksgiving and love that spreads across the entire cosmos. 
And so to think of these things as a mere exchange of goods and services, a human economy of quid pro quo, does an incredible disservice to the divine economy of abundant life. And this is seen most evidently in the lives of the clergy. It is not lost on me that everything I have has been given to me. I have not earned a penny of what I have, but it is a gift that I have received with gratitude. But here's the lesson for everyone. Everything we have is a gift that God has given us so that we can bless those around us. The air in your lungs is given that you may speak of God's love. The roof over your head is given that you might help others who lack a roof. The love you have received from God and others is given so that you may know love, how to receive it, and how to share it. And importantly, we do all of this, as Paul mentions, for the sake of the gospel, that we might share in its blessings which far outweigh gold and silver. For it is by this gospel that we are freed from the wheel of want and work to receive new life in Christ, to refocus our lives in the light of Christ's glory and promise, that we are in fact his brothers and sisters, and that while we can never earn his love, we nonetheless receive it as a gift, the gifts of God for the people of God. The question then becomes, how will we share this gift with others? And that's what we have to discern and figure out.